NGO strategies in an authoritarian context and their implications for citizenship. The case of the People's Republic of China by Jennifer Su, Carolyn Su, and Riza Hazmath. Section 1 Introduction In the past two decades, NGOs have risen substantially in the People's Republic of China with the latest figures indicating there are approximately 546,000 registered social organizations. Theorists from Alexis de Tocqueville to Robert Putnam have argued that increased in Robert Putnam have argued that increased individual level participation in social organizations lead to a healthy civil society with the social capital necessary to produce active, engaged citizens and vibrant democratic societies. This begs the question, how has the rise of very social organizations affected the practice of citizenship in China? Do they encourage citizens to actively engage with social issues and mobilize over areas of popular concern? Or do they reinforce passive acquiescence to government authority? Writing in 1840, Alexis de Tocqueville, writing in 1840, Alexis de Tocqueville offered the proposition that free and voluntary organizations were integral to society since they were the site where people were socialized into becoming effective and engaged citizens. By participating in voluntary organizations, people learn to apply the issues. In addition, they gain skills in mobilizing individuals and resources to achieve citizenry goals. In other words, they learn active citizenship. This is a sentiment that resonates with scholars such as Gramsci, who stress the role of autonomous, voluntary, social and antagonistic public space, and Putnam, who suggested that high levels of civic community was a major determining factor in the effectiveness of state governance. In the Chinese context, Empirical studies by White and White et al. of social organizations in Jiaoshan City in stations in Jiaoshan City in the early 1990s came to a similar conclusion, revealing that the growing sphere of associational life in China exhibited some of the defining qualities of civil society: autonomy, separation from the state, and voluntariness. If this is true, the rise of organizations could have serious implications for citizenship in China in the near future. Yet, this approach has been challenged on several grounds. One objection is that this perspective is too value-laden and historically specific to be applicable to authoritarian China. For instance, for instance Stu distinguishes between non-governmental society and civil society the latter being a subset of the former. Su suggests that the voluntary retreat of the state has not altered the belief that there should be no limits to state power. Therefore, the expansion of space for nothing more than sprouts of civil society. Yang and Calhoun take a different perspective. They argue that emerging environmental NGOs, ENGOs, in China have created a green public sphere. Writing after the 2008 Suchan earthquake, Tietz claims, Tietz claims that participation in relief efforts strengthens civil society through increased capacity, publicity, and interaction with local government, which may have triggered an emergence of civil society in China. In both cases, the terminology utilized requires significant qualification. Yang and Calhoun denote public sphere as space for public discourse and communication, while Tietz conceives civil society as a voluntary action-oriented space. Other critiques pose further difficulties to the de Tocquevillian approach. It identifies civil society as a realm of organized social life that is voluntary, self-generating, self-supporting, and autonomous from the state. But Chinese NGOs only enjoy limited degrees of autonomy in fact, a large number of Chinese NGOs are initiated and at least partially op initiated and at least partially operated by the state, blurring the boundary between state and society. He critiques the Gramsian model of anti-status civil society and uses semi-civil society to describe a more mutually reliant relationship. Frolic advances the concept of society, 
one that is created by the state to help it achieve better governance. U proposes a government-led civil society whose interests are similar with the state. While Frolic fails to take into account the rapid growth of grassroots organizations which have little state connection, U essentially does a state connection, U essentially denies agency to them. However, research reveals that cooperation with the state is often a strategic choice of Chinese NGOs whose survival depends on state leniency. In any case, NGOs operating in close partnership with the government may actually discourage their fellow citizens from actively mobilizing and organizing around social concerns. They may instead encourage passive citizenship and acquiescence to a paternalistic state. It is clear that all social organizations are not alike, and different types may lead to citizenship, hence the analytical confusion in the various debates highlighted. This article thus poses the following questions. 1. What factors shape the characteristics of Chinese social organizations? 2. How do the characteristics of Chinese social organizations shape the citizenship practices and shape the citizenship practices of their participants? This study analyzes 116 Chinese social organizations across four cities in mainland China, Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, and Kunming. Our analysis reveals that, on the one hand, Chinese political context, and, on the other hand, there are substantial variations that likely correlate with regional conditions. These differences are significant enough that it appears that each region may have its own organizational field with different organizational structures, practices, and cultures, structures, practices, and cultures. We find there are three distinct resource strategies that have emerged among NGOs in China. The donor dependency strategy, the state dependency strategy, and the volunteer dependency strategy. Each of these strategies facilitate a different type citizenship orientation. Section 2. Social Organizations and Organizational Fields Social organizations do not emerge and develop independently, but instead operate in a context of structural and cultural systems known as organizational fields. The field determines the rules of the game. Rules of the game. By making certain practices normal and expected while rendering alternatives difficult and even unimaginable. From the perspective of any given organization, the field contains its competitors, its role models, its potential partners, and its clients. Organizational fields interact with other organizational fields, shaping those rules of engagement as well. For example, Chinese NGOs interact within the organizational fields of state agencies, the mass media, and international NGOs and foundations. This last point is key since one of the primary tasks of any organization is to maintain, is to maintain its own survival by procuring a constant source of necessary resources. Its organizational field shapes the strategies it uses to solve that problem. In turn, the content of the structures and strategies have implications for an NGO's level of effectiveness. A strategy of dependency on private donations, for instance, puts NGOs at higher risk of global displacement as they are pressured to shift their orientation to please their donors. Meanwhile, the dependency on state funding leads to the bureaucratization of internal organizational structures. structures. Organizational fields not only determine the structures and distribution of material resources, but also shape the cultural beliefs and norms of member organizations. Organizations are more likely to succeed when they align themselves with the dominant cultural assumptions of the field, since they legitimacy to salient audiences. For example, studies illustrate that in societies where people believe the state holds the ultimate responsibility for social problems, gongos, government-organized NGOs, flourish while in societies where people believe that the responsibility rests with individuals, individuals, independent NGOs attract more volunteers. The culture, structures, and strategies of the organizational field do not exist only on an abstract institutional level, 
but instead they become internalized within the people who work in the organizations. Or, to turn it around, in the organization become socialized in the practices of the organizational field to the point that they carry those practices with them even when they operate outside of the organization. This is the basis of the de Tocquevillian argument about voluntary organizations and citizenship. The skills, norms, and tactics, tactics learned in voluntary organizations become transferred to citizen mobilization. For instance, political action takes the form of direct lobbying in the United States, since citizens drew upon their particular experience of popular associations to determine their political desires and develop strategies to pressure argument was about the United States as a whole. Yet, there is no reason to assume the organizational fields are necessarily coterminous with national borders. Even in the 19th century, de Tocqueville noted there were regional differences between New England and the slave-owning southern states. For example, 21st century, century China and the United States is significantly larger, more populous, and more heterogeneous than 1840s America. To account for the possibility of regional variations, it is important to look at the local ecology of opportunity as well as the national one. To sum up our theoretical approach, we argue the following. One, the collective rules of an emerging organizational field emerge out of the resource strategies of the individual organizations within that field. Two, those resources strategies are created in response to the ecology of opportunity both at the national level and the local level level. Three, as an organizational field becomes more institutionalized and more visible, it provides a template for other people and organizations to copy, thereby shaping practices outside of the organizational field. With the rapid increase in the number of NGOs in the PRC, many scholars have speculated that civil society and democratization could soon follow. If Chinese NGOs created an organizational field that promoted practices of mobilization and resistance, citizens could learn a model of organizing to limit the power of the government. What the ensuing research has made clear is that are not fomenting direct political activism and protest, but instead tend to work cooperatively and collaboratively with state actors and agencies. At the same time, these organizations are increasing in number, size, and political impact, shaping for areas such as educational policy, educational policy, religious practices, and environmental law. Suffice to say, Chinese NGOs are transforming the practice and power of citizenship in the People's Republic of China. But how? We hypothesize that there are more than one organizational field for Chinese NGOs. To support our data set for evidence of different organizational fields, different ecologies of opportunity, and different NGO resource strategies. These organizational fields presumably operate by different rules and promote different kinds of citizenship practices. Some encourage citizens to passively accept the benefits of an, the benefits of an authoritarian state while others offer citizens a model for organizing and engaging with social issues. Section 3. National Level Constraints Political Authoritarianism and Cultural Unfamiliarity Although our data revealed regional differences, there are certain constraints that all of the Chinese NGOs faced regardless of geography. First, they dealt with an authoritarian political context, where the state was unsupportive and even hostile to NGOs. Second, they have to negotiate a cultural context that possessed neither a contemporary tradition of non-state voluntary organizations, nor one of charitable giving. Both of these factors are rooted in China's socialist history. When Mao Zedong's Communist Party of China, CPC, claimed victory in 1949, it saw providing social welfare services as a prerogative of the party state and the basis of regime legitimacy. Private charities were replaced by direct government benefits or by government-controlled welfare organizations like the China Welfare League or Red Cross Society of China. As a result, the legal and social welfare institutions of the PRC were designed with no place whatsoever for voluntary social organizations. 
state actor actors and state agencies were socialized to treat NGOs as potential threats. Deng Xiaoping's 1979 market reforms shifted the burden of social welfare from the central government to local governments, communities, and households, making it possible for voluntary social organizations to emerge. Citizen organizations flourished briefly in the 1980s, but the crackdown following the 1989 Tiananmen protests snuffed out that emerging movement. In the 1990s, Howell could find no evidence of any social welfare NGOs in the nation. Chinese laws seemed to hinder rather than facilitate NGO work. Under both the 1998 and 2004 regulations, all Chinese social organizations were required to register with the Ministry of Civil Affairs, but this process was confusing and often impossible to accomplish. To register, an NGO had to have a government agency or gongo to act as its supervisory agency. Legally, all NGO funds were to be regularly audited, but there was no system set up to carry this out. According to regulations, there was a process by which nonprofit public institutions could be certified to fundraise domestically, but only a few state connected organizations were ever granted permission. Studies have shown that the majority of social organizations in China never properly registered with the government, choosing instead to either register incorrectly, for example, as a for-profit business, or not at all. Chinese legal re regulations for social organizations were not only restrictive, but inconsistently and even arbitrarily applied. In certain times and places, state actors supported social organizations and even fostered the creation and growth of NGOs. Legal regulations were revised in 2013, giving greater clarity and support for NGOs. However, two years later, the state cracked down on a handful of organizations. The tension between Chinese NGOs and the state has serious implications in the arena of resources. In many sections, the state is often a key source of funding for NGOs, but this is a rare in the PRC. In general, the only exception to this rule are gongos, which can in some cases receive a great deal of support from the state in the form of state grants, state contracts, and private donations from government officials and offices pressured to exhibit their generosity by supervisors. Another problem faced by early 21st century Chinese NGOs is that the Chinese populace generally found that the NGO concept unfamiliar and foreign. If they knew what NGOs were at all, they associated them with Western, Western missionaries and imperialism, and insisted that traditional Chinese culture lacked anything resembling non-state voluntary organizations. In reality, there was a vibrant tradition of private, voluntary philanthropy in the late imperial era, but the collective memory of those practices had been effectively erased by three decades of state-monopolized social welfare under Mao. The very idea of a non-governmental social welfare organization was so alien to most Chinese that even the direct beneficiaries of Chinese NGOs often had no idea what an NGO was. They assumed they were being served by a state agency or the Communist Party. The lack of cultural legitimacy hindered Chinese social organizations in a number of ways. In terms of finances, most Chinese citizens and businesses were not in the habit of giving charitable donations to private organizations. The domestic NGO sector was not seen as a locale for respectable careers, so it was challenging to hire and keep staff members. This problem was exasperated by the fact that financial constraints made it difficult to offer good wages. In some cities, it has become popular for middle-class educated youths to volunteer at a Chinese NGO a practice which became even trendier after the 2008 Wen Chan earthquake. However, they viewed their stints to be a temporary jaunt before getting a real job. Even those who took paid jobs at Chinese NGOs often viewed them as a stepping stone for a career at an international NGO or foundation. As a result, high staff turnover was an endemic problem for the organizations in our study. A key indicator of the maturation of the NGO sector is the participation of NGOs in an epistemic community, 
where shared normative and causal beliefs are displayed. Being part of an epistemic community, an organization develops the expertise to inform on evidence-based policy matters. Consulting government in setting standards is an important element of an epistemic community. To simultaneously convey the realities of local communities and affect the government's policymaking process, NGOs play a valuable role in social learning, raising awareness, monitoring and research to complement government policy deliberation and action. Suffice to say, NGOs have the capacity to identify issues, increase its salience, and to monitor a policy's implementation. However, such development are yet to take shape in the Chinese NGO sector. The ability of Chinese NGOs to participate in an epistemic community is in part stymied by the NGO's lack of interest and also the desire to focus on more immediate issues to service their constituents. Section 4. Local Constraints Beyond these national-level constraints, there is considerable variability in the ecologies of opportunity in which different Chinese NGOs find themselves. Studies demonstrate that social organizations in different sectors face variable conditions and engage in different strategies. For example, organizations that focus on high-priority problems, such as environmental protection, are more likely to develop profitable state partnerships, while NGOs focused on issues of interest to the international funding community, such as HIV AIDS prevention, will have to foreign foundations. An organization's strategies are also shaped by the institutional experiences and skill set of its founders and leaders. Here, we will focus on a third axis of differentiation, geographic variations. NGOs that operate in a large city with connections to wealthy donor owners are operating in a different ecology of opportunity than those situated in regional urban centers. Local governments display a range of attitudes towards social organizations. NGOs in cities with friendlier political officials will develop different strategies than those in more hostile environments. Wu and E NGOs operating in two different provinces and found that organizations in neither region were able to access the kind of international funding that their counterparts in Beijing received. However, ENGOs in one province were able to work more productively with the local government than NGOs of the other province. Section 5. Methodology and Sample A total of 116 NGOs interviewed and surveyed face-to-face -face across four cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Kunming, and Nanjing, in China from end of 2012 to early 2014. They looked into the organizational behavior of NGOs in terms of resource strategies, engagement with other organizational actors, and the delivery of services. NGOs were selected based on a snowballing technique. Although we acknowledge some of the limitations of snowball sampling, such, such as selection bias, at this point in time there is no viable alternative form of sampli, sampling available for these organizations. This is notably the case given there is nothing resembling a comprehensive list of Chinese NGOs available. The government does not publish such data, and even if it, the result would be problematic for a number of reasons. First, over the past three decades, the Chinese government has used multiple categories for organizations that social scientists consider NGOs, yet until recently has not offered any clear definitions for these categories. Second, there is evidence that a significant, evidence that a significant proportion of Chinese NGOs were not registered with the government either because the requirements were too difficult to meet or because the organization deliberately wants to maintain a low profile. Third, because so many Chinese NGOs were operating in a legal gray zone, he put on a comprehensive list collated even by a non-government surveyor. Due to these conditions, the only way to amass a sample of Chinese NGOs is through networks and to compare one's own sample with the snowball samples assembled by other scholars. Of the 116 NGOs interviewed, 30 were from Beijing, 19 from Shanghai, 40 from Kunming, and 27 from Nanjing. The average organizational age of the NGOs across the four cities is 8.6. In Beijing, 10.3. In Shanghai, 10.4. 
8.4 in Nanjing, Nanjing, and 12.6 in Kanming. NGOs in our sample engage in a variety of different issue areas, with the following being most common health, welfare, education, and environment. Furthermore, there was some variability in each city sampled. In Beijing, NGOs engaged primarily in the areas of education and health. In Shanghai, among 19 NGOs, five engaged in welfare and six in education. In Nanjing, 13 out of 27 were in welfare. In Kanming, five NGOs out of 40 engaged in the health sector. The semi-structured interviews covered a broad range of topics, including organizational ecology, recruitment, engagement with the government, and service delivery. The interviews were conducted in Mandarin, lasting between 60 to 90 minutes. Interviewees were those who represented the organization in a founder or project officers. Prior to the interviews, a brief paper questionnaire was distributed to a certain basic information on the NGO, including year of founding, number of employees, sources of funding, areas of work, amongst others. The combination of interview and a basic survey allowed us to capture essential information, as well as to tease out perennial issues through face-to-face -face conversation. The majority of the NGOs work in the broad area of service delivery, but we have further divided this category to be more specific. Welfare, health, education, education and community development. While these four service delivery areas are equally broad, we have attempted to differentiate the type of work NGOs are engaged in. Welfare NGOs were engaged in the care of the elderly, orphans, disabled or poverty alleviation. Health-focused NGOs generally adjust and other disease or illness. Education NGOs delivered education materials to rural villages, redeveloped curriculum, and were often involved in educating migrant children. Community development NGOs includes organizations that worked with local communities across different subgroups, across different subgroups, and addressed intersecting issues, such as community participation of the elderly. Our sample resonates with the findings of Xi and Browniz, whereby they found in their survey, NGOs were predominantly engaged in the service delivery sector, with attention notably to education facilities, elderly care, and child welfare. Furthermore, as Xi and Browniz found in their survey, half of elderly care NGOs were located in Beijing, Shanghai, and Sichuan and their assessment of Jiangsu province indicated approximately 50% of organizations surveyed in the region were engaged in service provision. Suffice to say, while we recognize the problems with snowball sampling, with the potential to lead to path dependence, our results confirms existing research, with the caveat that other surveys potentially experienced pr similar problems of snowball sampling in sites across China. China. Section 6. Results. Regional Variations in Resource Strategies. When comparing NGOs from our sample in the four cities, we find evidence that there are regional variations in sources of funding, state engagement, and organizational structure. In other words, Chinese NGOs in different cities are reacting to different ecologies of opportunity. Depending on the local jurisdiction, certain resources are easy to obtain, while others are difficult to access. Due to these different environments, NGOs develop distinct strategies. In Table 1, NGOs self-reported data outlining the source of major funding, defined as 40% of the NGO's total funding, is displayed. The survey provided eight options for the respondent, central government, provincial government, local government, international grants, domestic donations by individuals or private foundations, membership fees, fees from services, and other. Respondents had the option to take as many options as perennial to their organization. Thus, in Table 1, the results are the total counts from the 116 NGOs surveyed. A brief note on each category is in order before moving further. The domestic category encompasses funding from foundations, charities, fundraising, and other private sources. 
International funding represents support from international philanthropic groups, NGOs, foreign development assistance, and, so and sources of a similar nature. Funding from government sources is separated into local, in other words, provincial level and below, and central. The fees category represents fees charged for services provided and or membership fees. And finally, corporate indicates sponsorship from corporations and private enterprises. Table 2 reveals relationships with the state, disaggregated by central, provincial, and local government interactions. Interestingly, some NGOs self-reported multiple interactions with various levels of the state over the course of the past year, and others reported interactions with all levels of the state. This question on interactions on the survey is intentionally broad as we sought to dwell further into issues of engagement with the authorities during the interviews, asking them to describe any past, existing, or potential future relationships. We also asked our respondents to explain why their organizations engage with the different levels of authorities named. Table 3 displays the average full and part-time staff across all NGOs surveyed, as well as the number of volunteers. Donor Dependency Strategy – Beijing and Shanghai Beijing and Shanghai are China's largest cities, with total populations of over 20 million each in the 2010 census. Chinese NGOs in both Beijing and Shanghai have access to wealthier donor bases than regional cities like Kunming and Nanjing. But for different reasons, consistent with previous research, we find that Beijing NGOs are more likely to get contributions from foreign foundations than organizations in other cities. Shanghai-based organizations can receive money from wealthy local businesses. Beijing is China's political center, while Shanghai is its business capital. Both cities enjoy a robust international presence. Yet, as we can see from Table 1, Two-thirds of Beijing NGOs receive international funding, while only about a third of Shanghai organizations do. Why? Potentially, the government still controls a great deal of access to international funders through the filter model. Foreign funds are received by the Chinese government, and officials then pass the funds on to the NGOs of their choosing. When an international organization comes into China, whether it is the World Bank or the Ford Foundation or an international NGO, they need to work with and through the Chinese government. Chinese NGOs' members can benefit greatly if their leaders and members can meet these wealthy foreigners. However, that is only likely to happen if those leaders or members have some kind of relationship with a government official working with the international foundation. This is much less likely to happen outside of Beijing, where, where NGO members have spouses, relatives, friends, and former classmates in the central government, or who are themselves former central government cadres. As we can see from Table 2, NGOs from all regions have connections with government officials. However, in other cities, these relationships can only be built with local local level cadres, or more rarely, provincial level ones. In Beijing, by contrast, it is possible to connect with central government officials and offices. In comparison, NGOs in Shanghai, similarly international in orientation, have relied far more on domestic sources, 61.2% of reported incidences, than on international sources, 22.6%. Shanghai's business community, after all, is wealthier and more robust than the ones in Kanming and Nanjing. A 2015 list of Chinese individuals with 10 million or more yen that almost 15% lived in Shanghai, with just over 1% lived in Nanjing. Kanming did not even merit a mention on the list. At the same time, the Shanghai government is not known to be particularly supportive of NGOs. Thus, our findings indicate that Shanghai NGOs are more likely to tur turn to their local business community for donations compared to their Beijing counterparts. 10.5% of interviewed Shanghai NGOs had funding from corporate sources compared to 67 in Beijing, and zero in Kanming and Nanjing. The presence of wealthy donors meant that NGOs in Beijing and Shanghai can eschew other resource strategies.
Beijing's NGOs were more likely to avoid all types of relationships with state officials than NGOs in other cities, a luxury that came from generous amounts of international funding. Even though most NGOs in both Beijing and Shanghai built connections with government officials, these relationships were informal rather than formal. These organizations rarely received any government funding unlike NGOs in Kanming and Nanjing. They almost never had official government contracts, nor were they dependent on volunteers. From Table 3-3, we can see that the average Beijing or Shanghai NGO had a very small number of volunteers compared to Nanjing. For these organizations, volunteers were there to augment the paid staff rather than to do the lion's share of the labor. State Dependency Strategy, Kanming Kanming is the capital of the Yunnan province bordering the Tibet Autonomous Region and Myanmar. With a population of 3.5 million, it is much smaller than Beijing or Shanghai. Although the city is less well-known by Westerners than Beijing or Shanghai, it has been a hotbed of indigenous NGO development for the last two decades. As we can see from Table 1, the majority of Kanming's NGOs were able to access international funding at a rate second only to Beijing. Half of Kanming's NGO received domestic donations akin to NGOs in Shanghai. However, the difference between Kanming and those larger cities is the amount of funding received from these sources. Although Kanming NGOs were able to access funding from more sources than organizations anywhere else, they were on average the poorest NGOs in our sample. The average Kanming NGO only had a fraction of the funding that NGOs enjoyed in Beijing, Shanghai, and Nanjing. They were underfunded even when we control for the fact that Kanming was a less wealthy city and presumably less expensive city than the others. Kanming's GDP per capita was between 50 to 60 percent that of Shanghai or Beijing, but in our sample, its NGOs only had on average less than 30 percent of the budget of the average Shanghai NGO and 16 percent of the budget of the average Beijing NGO. Kanming NGOs may have been poor in terms of capital, but according to existing scholarship, organizations in Yunnan benefited from better relationships with local government than those located in other Chinese regions. Beginning in the mid-1990s, the Yunnan government departments reacted to inadequate state funding for social services by building connections with local and international NGOs. The Yunnan model relied on local state agencies and grassroots groups collaborating on projects with the resources for these projects procured by the government from international sources. In this way, Kanming's NGOs also gained access to international funding through the relationships with state officials, although the amounts were considerably smaller than that available to Beijing NGOs. Our own data confirms this. Like Beijing NGOs, about two-thirds of the NGOs in Kanming received international funding, but they were much less wealthy than their Beijing counterparts. Unlike organizations in Beijing and Shanghai, many Kanming NGOs received funding from the government and had more interactions with the local government. For example, Jia Xin's representative, a child welfare NGO in Kanming, noted their extensive collaboration with the Street Neighborhood Committee. If we need to put a program on and we need to communicate with the Neighborhood Committee, they will help us to communicate on the locals. As the Yunnan Natural and Cultural Heritage Conservation Council representative noted, organizations such as theirs have the ideas and research capacity to address environmental issues. But without government support, namely the Provincial Environmental Protection Bureau, both stakeholders would not be able to achieve their goals. Interestingly, this was framed within the notion of trust. We need each other. We need to trust each other. Furthermore, this representative was with regards to the division of labor. The government gives the money and we do the research work. Strap for funding, Kunmin NGOs were more likely to engage in a strategy of state dependency, where NGOs partner closely with government organizations. When an NGO developed a method for solving the social problem, 
Instead of implementing it on its own, it allowed its government partner to take the idea and implement it. This strategy has seemingly worked for the Kunmin-based NGOs for the last decade. As Jin Jianmin, a head of an ENGO who conducted projects in Yunnan province, explained, I feel that what a Chinese NGO can do is come up with a new concept or a new idea, and you want to apply that locally. You first make a demonstration model, you do it on a small scale, when you have enough experience and get that model to work well, you can then inform the government and provide the government with something to copy and paste. So eventually, when the government is copying your model and promoting it on a large scale, it will have a huge effect. In our sample, Kanming NGOs, along with Nanjing NGOs, were more likely to have placed a bid for an official state contract than organizations in Beijing or Shanghai. 18 of the 40 surveyed NGOs in Kanming had put in a bid for government contract compared to zero in Beijing, one in Shanghai, and 19 in Nanjing. The state dependency strategy permitted Kanming NGOs to serve a lot of individuals without requiring large amounts of funds. As we see from Table 3, on average, NGOs in Kanming had more staff members than organizations in other cities, although these organizations were still not very large. Their paid staff-to-volunteer ratio was also higher than their counterparts elsewhere. Volunteer Dependency Nanjing Nanjing is the second largest city in eastern China, with a population of approximately 7 million. Located not far from Shanghai, it is the capital of the Jiangsu province, one of the most economically developed areas in China. Nanjing's GDP per capita is higher than Beijing or Shanghai, and over twice as much as that of Kanming. However, there are few extremely wealthy people in Nanjing, of all the individuals in China who had over 10 million or more yen in wealth, less than 2% lived in Nanjing compared to 15% in Shanghai and 18% in Beijing. There have been very few studies of NGOs in Nanjing compared to the amount of research conducted in Beijing, Shanghai, and Kanming. According to our findings, NGOs in Nanjing, like the ones in Kanming, are more likely to build relationships with local officials and to receive funding from the local government than organizations in Beijing or Shanghai. As noted above, where 19 of the 27 surveyed Nanjing NGOs had bid for government contracts, Nanjing NGOs differ from Kanming organizations in that many of them also receive funding from fees, as seen in Table 1. This could be a potentially lucrative source of funding, since NGOs in Nanjing have more volunteers than organizations in any of the other three cities, and thus more able to conduct program delivery that rely on the labor of the volunteers. While NGOs in Beijing, Shanghai, and Kanming may have a handful or a few dozen volunteers, Nanjing organizations have hundreds, even thousands. Two organizations in Nanjing, Yun Delaling and Sunny Home, self-reported having 3,000 volunteers each. Other Nanjing organizations were unable to give a concrete number, simply explaining they had hundreds of volunteers, many of which are project-based. We can potentially see that the volunteer dependency strategy is a useful way to negotiate China's relatively unfriendly resource landscape. In the case of Nanjing, NGOs were able to access enormous human power at little to no cost. Although, like NGOs all over China, Nanjing organizations built useful relationships with government officials, the volunteer dependency strategy was one way to avoid too many entanglements with the state. Adding volunteers was a means for an organization to grow without officially increasing in size, which might trigger unwanted government attention. NGOs could even claim that they were not NGOs, but instead just clubs or websites which did not have to abide by NGO regulation. This was the strategy adopted by a Cancer Patients Rehabilitation Center. The founder of the center expressed a strong desire not to become a legally registered entity, as she did not want the organization to be bogged down in bureaucracy. Such status would also allow her organization greater flexibility 
enabling the center to provide real personal services to members of the community via the volunteer base where all members of the center are volunteers. The leveraging of such strategies not to seek registration, reliance on volunteers, and general flexibility allows organizations such as the center a possibility to navigate the environment where NGOs may not always be well regarded by local authorities. Section 7. Discussion, Resource Strategies, and Citizenship. In each of these cases, NGOs react to their specific local environment by taking advantage of the resources that are readily available, whether it was donor funding in Beijing and Shanghai, state, partnership, state partnerships in Kunming, or a volunteer-based strategy in Nanjing, and use it as the centerpiece of their organizational strategy. It is important to note that these are regional trends, not hard and fast rules. It would not be impossible to find a Beijing NGO that allows a state partner that allows a state partner to cut and paste its models, or a Kunming NGO that receives a generous amount of foreign funding. However, through isomorphic pressures, NGOs in an organizational field will tend to imitate each other and end up with similar practices. These practices, in turn, have implications for citizenship. According to Perry, democracy in China has very little to do with multi-party elections, but instead focuses on whether the government benefits the people and reflects the will of the people. Perry reinforces this stance by pointing to a 2011 national survey conducted by the Chinese of Social Sciences, whereby 85% of respondents define democracy as a system in which government leaders reflect people's interests, serves the people, and submit to supervision by the people. In such a system, the key modus operandi is how ordinary citizens organize and mobilize ordinary citizens organize and mobilize around their interests in such a way to make their concerns visible, both to state actors on one hand, so that the government can respond to their issues, and to their fellow citizens on the other hand, so the populace can judge whether the state is performing its democratic duties or not, which has implications for whose voices are amplified and whose are suppressed. Donor Dependency Strategy In both Beijing and Shanghai, NGOs had the possibility of accessing more generous donors than organizations elsewhere in China. This donor dependency, donor dependency strategy has implications for citizenship, since it offers a model of mobilization that successfully shapes state policy, but is much more accessible to elites than ordinary citizens. At the national policy level, there is some reason to believe that NGOs are backed by significant amounts of, significant amounts of donor money and are in better position to influence government policy, especially in Beijing, where they have access to powerful government officials. We can see this in Beijing's environmental movement, which has affected state policy both directly and indirectly. When NGOs and other, envir other environmental activists protested and asserted that the 2012 draft of China's new environmental protection law was too weak, the government subsequently strengthened the law. Among other things, the new law, which went into effect in 2015, permitted NGOs to file environmental, environmental lawsuits against violators. In addition, well-funded NGOs could launch educational campaigns in order to foster concern among the populace about a particular social problem. If they were successful, popular pressures would force the state to react with better policies. For example, conversations with an environmental journalist working for a Beijing NGO suggested that NGOs working on issues of climate change had relatively more sway than other ENGOs. On the issue of climate change, the Chinese government has a discussion representative delegation, and these people do not try sometimes because they participate in international debates and negotiations and understand international situations, including international NGOs and their effect. Also, sometimes government voices need NGOs to promote their interests. Thus, certain environmental issues, in this case, mental issues, in this case transnational issues such as climate change, may garner greater government attention with the potential for NGOs to inform or participate in the policy dialogue. 
However, donor dependency strategies also have potentially negative outcomes for NGOs. For instance, for instance, funding is not equally available to all NGOs, nor to every person or group who want to start an NGO. Funding is generally available to those NGOs with leaders that have strong personal connections to donors. A significant portion of Beijing's best-funded ENGOs, for example, for example, were all founded by an interconnected group of friends, former colleagues, and classmates who all came from high-status backgrounds. Also, Chinese NGOs that require donor funding could experience pressure to change their structure and approach to please their donors. Organizations dependent on government funding. Unfortunately, many of the characteristics favored by donors undermined active citizenship. This is reinforced by research suggesting that foundations favored organizations that were less radical and more supportive of the status quo. They also had a tendency to fund organizations that resembled their own in terms of organizational culture and structure. In China, Western foundations and international NGOs have routinely set up training sessions teaching local NGOs the way to attract more international funding was to become more professionalized professionalized, exhibiting legitimacy through elite expertise with hierarchical top-down organizational structures, rather than through participatory or democratic processes. Even though many of the donors in Beijing were organizations from the democratic West, their funding did not necessarily promote, not necessarily promote democratic practices or active citizenship within the organization they fund. Instead, donor dependency created a type of elite citizenship where the well-educated and well-connected are able to influence state policy. State Dependency Strategy did not enjoy the kind of generous funding available in other cities. However, Kunming's NGOs could build useful relationships with supportive state officials. To some extent, NGOs could act like an outsourced department of the government. Developing solutions to social problems that would then be adopted and would then be adopted and implemented on a wider scale by the state. State dependency strategies allowed small, underfunded organizations to have significant impact on potentially large populations. The culturally focused Shanghai-based NGO Han Wei Yang, for, exa for example, noted that their funding came primarily from the local authorities with the potential that such support could alter the aims, objectives of their organization. The organization's affiliation with the Luan District's Cultural Bureau Office indicates that not only is there, a close is there a close relationship between the two, but that financial support may engender a level of dependency, whereby financial support may shape the organization's programming that are more attuned to that of the local government. The state dependency strategy had some advantages over donor dependency, over donor dependency. Foremost, the state dependency strategy is less elitist than the donor dependency strategy. The party state bureaucracy is so large in China that many urban citizens know someone who works for the government, especially at the local level. Of course, the more powerful the official, the more useful the connection is. So NGOs with high status members are still at an advantage over others. However, there are costs to the state dependency strategy. To foster state partnerships, NGOs had to operate by a set of unspoken rules. It was necessary to avoid politicized topics that could push for social transformation, but not for political change. This is certainly the case with Huawei Yang in Shanghai, where revival of cultural traditions is seen as transformative bringing cultural well-being to the community. NGOs that fail to comply with these conditions would risk having their support cut, being denied access to their clients, or even being prematurely shut down. The only reason these constraints did not cause goal displacement was that many state-dependent NGOs were started by former bureaucrats who had internalized these rules so thoroughly that it never occurred to them to do anything else. The state dependency strategy was an effective method of citizen action in that it actually transformed state behavior.
Notwithstanding, it required NGOs to be invisible so that other citizens do not have a reason to participate with the NGO's activity, to the extent that most citizens do not have a notion that an NGO was involved. It was a, com it was a common practice among state-dependent NGOs to allow their government partners to take full credit for their ideas. When interviewed, NGO leaders would claim that they had no issues with this outcome, as long as citizens' needs were served. According to the representative of the Honglu Care Center, NGOs such as, those, such as those working with the disabled in Nanjing are not able to provide the quality of care needed because such NGOs are so focused on organizational survival, as demonstrated by the need to assure continuous funding. Moreover, as many disability-focused NGOs are staffed by disabled, people them by disabled people themselves, the need to seek government funding and ensure organizational survival indicates that the time available to promote in community engagement and foster community citizenship is very limited. NGOs are populated entirely by disabled people themselves. They get together to help each other, but there aren't that many professional staff members. There should be more training, more quality assurance, to ensure that NGOs can continue to develop and improve, and that the sector is sustainable. For NGOs in the disability sector to rely on government funding, noted repeatedly by interviewees as insufficient, means that these NGOs are ensuring sustained government attention and awareness on issues of disability, perhaps the expense of other types of NGOs, as suggested by Lai Mei Chu of the Nanjing Sangshan Arts Development Center. Development Center. The strategy of state dependency meant that NGOs helped to increase state power rather than reduce it, pushing the state to address increasing social problems and pass effective regulations. These NGOs have found a way to transform the Chinese government to make it more competent and less corrupt. Competent and less corrupt. Citizens outside of the NGO would benefit, but they would learn nothing about active citizenship. Volunteer Dependency Strategy Neither the donor dependency strategy nor the state dependency strategy involved promoting active participation by Nanjing pulled hundreds to thousands of individuals into social action, with the high possibility of giving the volunteers a taste of active citizenship. The strategy also gave many NGOs more autonomy. They were not beholden to donors or dependent on the state. Although as indicated in the previous section, Nanjing's disability-focused NGOs with their greater state-dependent strategies may be the exception. Suffice to say, these organizations were less at risk of goal displacement than donor-dependent or state-dependent NGOs. Yet, this did not mean that volunteer-dependent NGOs were able to engage in controversial political ad advocacy. Instead, studies suggest that they avoided those topics because they did not want to draw unwanted attention from the government. Consequently, they were no more likely than state-dependent NGOs to criticize the government or advocate for political reform. In fact, in fact compared to state-dependent or donor-dependent NGOs, volunteer-dependent organizations have had the least impact in shaping government policy. What they did do, however, was to teach ordinary citizens how to organize and advocate on their own behalf. While seemingly contradictory, as we suggest in the previous section on disability issues, Largely staffed by those with a disability may not have the luxury to engage in the community with regards to citizenship development. Yet, for those involved and with disability, it offers an opportunity to build and solidify their community. Build and solidify their community. Section 8. Conclusion. Alexis de Tocqueville argued that people learned the practices of democratic citizenship by participating in voluntary organizations. They would gain the behaviors of self-rule, organization, immobilization as members of voluntary organizations, and take those behaviors with them when they interacted with larger society. Here, we revise de Tocqueville's premise to apply to 21st century China. Instead of assuming that Chinese NGOs would look like de Tocqueville's American voluntary organizations, 
we looked at NGOs in four cities to see empirically the kinds of practices they used. What we found was that the practices of Chinese NGOs are strongly shaped by the national political context, but also by substantial regional variations. Since organizations need resources to survive, they adapted the practices to take advantage of the resource sources available to them. In some cities, such as Beijing and Shanghai, that meant orienting the NGO to take advantage of wealthy donors, whether those were international foundations or rich entrepreneurs. In other places, such as Kanming, it made more sense to build alliances with state departments because government officials there were friendly towards NGOs. In Nanjing, where neither of these options were available, NGOs concluded that the best tactic was to scale up through volunteers. Like de Tocqueville, institutional scholars argue that when people participate in an organization, they internalize its practices and return to those behaviors even after they walked out of the doors. However, we cannot assume that Chinese NGO participants are learning the same practices that de Tocqueville subjects were learning in 19th century America. We also cannot assume that these practices are conducive to active and engaged democratic citizenship. Instead, we find that certain NGO practices, such as donor dependency, may teach citizens that social engagement is only possible for elites, excellent educational credentials, and inviolable social networks. In contrast, state dependency NGOs practices hide the work of activist citizens even as it makes the state more powerful and effective. The people outside of the NGOs never get to see a model of mobilized citizen engagement, but instead are taught to be passive beneficiaries of the paternalistic state. However, organizations that engage in volunteer-dependent practices do offer a model of activist, organized engagement to their fellow citizens, teaching them a way to mobilize to respond to social problems and interact with the state. While the other two forms of NGO practices may be more effective in solving social problems, we argue that this last set of practices is the most potent for promoting democratic, engaged citizenship.